Welcome to this introductory first week of our course on the superorganism concept in health and disease. During this week, we will provide you with the theoretical background of the superorganism concept and introduce and explain the underlying basic principles of our relationship with microorganisms. First, I will start with an introductory presentation. To fully appreciate the meaning of the superorganism concept, we have to take a look at the evolutionary history of our coexistence with microorganisms. Bacteria are the first living organisms on the Earth and have a history of 3.5 billion years. At some point, multicellular organisms emerged and they immediately became colonized with bacteria on their surfaces. Since then, the hosts and the microorganisms colonizing their surfaces have evolved in a process called coevolution. Coevolution means mutual adaptation and for example means that bacteria that colonize our surfaces have a gross optimum at 37 degrees whereas if you find an animal that has a body temperature of 20 degrees Celsius you'll find that the bacteria colonizing their surfaces have a gross optimum at 20 degrees Celsius. Likewise you can find many examples of bacteria adhering to specific receptors that are present on the surface of their respective hosts. And you can also find that the bacteria use host-specific mechanisms to, for example, get access to iron, which is important for their growth and survival. As you can see from the yellow arrow, humans are, of course, a very recent part of this long-term evolution. The surfaces of our body that become colonized with bacteria are two kinds, the skin and the mucosal membranes. The skin has a surface area of approximately 1.8 square meters, whereas the mucosal membranes that cover the respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, and the urogenital tracts have a combined surface of approximately 400 square meters, which is the equivalent of a tennis court. So it's an, an immense surface that we have on our mucosal surfaces. It has been calculated that our own body consists of 10 to the 13 cells, whereas the number of bacteria that colonize our surfaces, that is the skin and our mucosal surfaces, add up to 10 times that number that is 10 to the 14 bacteria. And here we are only talking about bacteria. There are other microorganisms that add to this complexity. And this is what we call the superorganism. The combined cells of our own body and all the bacteria and other microorganisms that grow on our surface. And as you can see on the cover, of an issue of nature. People are now starting to talk about our other genome, which is the genome, the combined genomes of all the microorganisms that colonize our surfaces. During this co-evolution of microorganisms with their respective hosts, there is also 
clear examples of co-evolution of the individual members of the microbiota that colonize our surfaces. To the left, you see a picture of two kinds of bacteria that adhere to each other, a long filamentous bacterium, which is covered by coccoid bacteria. This is a good example of two kinds of bacteria that collaborate to degrade the potential food mechanism or food components that they are exposed to. Alone they would not be able to explore the same compounds. To the right you see the opposite. You see two examples that have antagonistic properties. In the middle you will see a bacterium from the skin which secretes a compound that inhibits the other bacterium which is also a predominant member of the skin microbiota. So you'll find examples of symbiosis as well as antagonism within our human microbiome. And this is important because along with the diversity of our microbiome, which you will hear consists of more than a thousand different bacterial species, these interactions, both symbiosis and antagonism, add to the stability of the microbial ecosystem on our surfaces. And stability is important for health. There is another component of this complex microbiome. Bacteria are infected with viruses, just like we are infected with viruses, as you will hear later during this course. Bacteria also have their own viruses. We call them also bacteriophages. And they have two important properties. They can regulate the bacterial load in an ecosystem by lysing the bacteria so that they are eliminated. But it is also clear that these viruses can function as a vector for import of genes that increase the ecological fitness, including resistance to antibiotics and also all the properties that adds to a bacterium's ability to cause infections, what we call virulence factors. So the essence of this coevolution is that as a result of the millions of years of coevolution, there is now evidence of mutual adaptation and also of functional integration between the microorganisms and their respective hosts. And perhaps the best example of this functional integration is our own cells. If you look at our own cells, you may remember that in the cytoplasma of our cells, we have a number of different organelles, including the mitochondria, which are key to the production of energy in our cells. It is now known that these mitochondria are in fact bacteria, bacteria that have their own DNA, and as a result of this, you can also determine which bacteria they initially were, but bacteria that at some point of evolution have entered a cell and have taken over this important function of the cell. So, a clear example of functional integration. How about viruses? Do we live in harmony with viruses? Well, we certainly do, because now that we have the complete human genome, we know that approximately 45% of the human genome is virus DNA, which has played a significant role in the evolution of our genome, as well as our physiological 
characteristics. You will hear much more about this in the third week of this course. It is also interesting that now that we can look in great detail at the genes and gene sequences of our genome and that of other living organisms, it is also clear that there are examples of bacteria that have transferred a considerable part of their genome into their host and meaning that the bacterial gene sequences have become integrated in the genome of the host, just like we just heard about viral DNA. This has been demonstrated in some insects and nematodes, and there is considerable interest in similar examples in the human genome. So far I've talked mainly on bacteria and viruses, but in addition to that, we also have in our microbiome microfungi as well as parasites with the same evolutionary history. So the next question that we could ask is, how is the composition of the complex microbiota associated with humans determined? Well, the reason for the explosion of our understanding of this complex interaction with our microbiota is that the gene sequencing technology has developed and has become an easy method to use in laboratories around the world. Let me show you how you can determine the composition of a complex microbiota, such as we find on our surfaces in the upper respiratory tract or in the gut or in on other surfaces. And just the same technique is also applied in studies of environmental samples. This technique takes advantage of the fact that all living organisms have genes that encode for ribosomal RNA. In bacteria we find the so-called 16S ribosomal RNA genes. And if you take a complex microbial sample from, for example, the gastrointestinal tract, you can extract DNA from all the bacteria in the sample. And by designing primers, you can also, by PCR, amplify specifically all the 16S RNA gene sequences. They can then be sequenced by the advanced technology that is available today. And if you take these sequences, and this is often millions of sequences that you generate from a complex microbial sample, you can align these sequences, and then you can make a so-called cluster analysis and include reference sequences for comparison. If you make such a cluster analysis, as you will see on the lower part to the right of this slide, you can actually identify all the lineages of bacteria representing different taxonomic groups or species of the bacteria that colonize the sample that was examined. The resolution of this technique 
is still relatively limited. But certainly you can get an impression of the degree of species diversity within a sample. We're still not able to look at the individual strains of bacteria, but we can look at the different taxonomic groups at a higher level. The highest level is what we call Fule. And if you take a sample of feces, for example, you'll find that there may be up to 10 different Fule in a sample. And this is the highest group of bacteria. In general, in nature, we have more than 70 different bacterial fulae. Of these, only 7 to 8 of them colonize humans. Fulae can then be subdivided into families, and families can be subdivided into genera. And if we look at the number of genera, you'll see on this slide then in the gastrointestinal tract, we have approximately 200 genera. And genera consist of species. And if you look at the number of species in gut samples, you'll find that we have in the gut approximately seven to 800 different species of bacteria. And either each of these species consists of many, many different strains. And if you add all this up, you'll see that a human gastrointestinal tract is colonized with close to 10,000 different strains of bacteria. In this way, you can map the intestinal microflora. And here you have a phylogenetic tree generated by cluster analysis of 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences. And you will see some examples of Fule, which are predominant in the intestinal microbiota. For example, the Firmicutes, which are all the gram-positive bacteria you'll hear more about later in this course. And another major group is the bacteri Bacteroides, uh, which are anaerobic bacteria that are prevalent in the gastrointestinal tract. As you can see in this particular study from 2005, based on mucosal samples obtained from sites within six subdivisions of the colon and stool, this picture was obtained from three healthy individuals. The beauty of this technique is that if you study more individuals, you can start seeing differences between individuals and you can also relate your findings to health or disease in the subjects that are being studied. On this slide, you see the same tree as I showed you a moment ago. This is a representation of the microorganisms or the bacteria that colonize the gastrointestinal tract of humans. And you'll see a particular pattern of clusters of bacteria, and you'll see some of the names I mentioned previously, the Firmicutes, the Bacteroidetes, the Proteobacteria, and other Fulae. This is the way it looks in humans. In the 
picture at the lower part of this slide, you'll see a comparison of the pattern of the microbiota in humans and in other mammals, that is mice, cattle and pigs. And you will immediately see that the overall pattern of these trees are almost identical. So by a very selective process, we, as well as other mammals, become colonized with highly similar bacterial microbiotas. However, if you look in detail at these results, it becomes clear that although these bacteria belong to the same groups of bacteria, the individual species are distinct. And this is one of the results of the co-evolution that I mentioned to you, that we humans are colonized with bacteria that are different from the bacteria that colonize mice or cattle or pigs. So although the overall picture is identical, the actual species are specific to the individual hosts and have adapted to that particular host. There are examples of a few species that can actually colonize both humans and various animals. You may have heard of the MRSA, Staphylococcus aureus, which are colonizing pigs as well as humans. And there are also coli bacteria that can colonize a number of different hosts. But those are exceptions. Most of the species are specific to the individual host that they have co-evolved with. And if you look at the mouse, you also see a different pattern. And likewise in the esophagus, in the stomach, and in the vagina. Moreover, if you look at even more detail, you'll find, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract, that you will find distinct microbiotas in the stomach, in the duodenum, in the other parts of the small intestine, and in the colon. Even the appendix has its own microbiota, and there are some who consider the appendix a safe house for symbiotic gut microbes from which our gastrointestinal microflora can redevelop if it has been eradicated by antibiotic treatment or after a case of diarrhea. And likewise, if you look at the oral cavity and other parts of the body, you'll find a number of smaller distinct habitats, each colonized with a distinct microbiota. Now that the DNA sequencing technology has advanced even further into what we call deep sequencing, you can add more information to our knowledge about this complex microbiota. Instead of amplifying specifically the 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences, you can sequence all the DNA that you can extract from a sample, for example, from the gastrointestinal tract. And if you then examine the sequences, you can annotate the sequences and divide the sequences into genes that are involved in amino acid metabolism, genes that are involved in carbohydrate metabolism, in DNA replication and recombination, in signal transduction, in transcription, in lipid metabolism, 
and so on. So in that way, you obtain information about all the metabolic processes that take place within a particular anatomical site of the human body. By using this technique, a Danish-Chinese consortium has determined all the genes in the gastrointestinal tract of 124 European individuals. And they did that by sequencing a total of 576.7 gigabases, which is the equivalent of, as you can see, 576,000 million base pairs of DNA. The result was that the entire cohort carried between 1,000 and 1,150 prevalent bacterial species, at least 160 species per individual, which are largely shared. Moreover, and even more exciting, is the fact that among all the genes that were examined, there were 3.3 million non-redundant bacterial genes, which is more than 150 times more gene than you will find in the human genome. So a substantial number of genes present in our gastrointestinal tract as well as on other mucosal surfaces and skin surfaces of the body. So the next question I would like to address is where does our microbiota come from? Studies have now demonstrated that newborns become colonized during the birth by colonization with microorganisms that are present in the birth canal of the mother. If you compare different individuals, different newborns, as, press, as demonstrated on this slide, you'll see the pattern of colonization during the first days and up to approximately 250 days. That is the first part of the life of the newborn. Each of these lines with different colors, colors represent different groups of bacteria. And it looks rather chaotic, as you can see. Different patterns in the different newborns. And this is also what you see, but you will see also that all the bacteria are bacteria that have been acquired from the mother. You find no bacteria from the environment, at least not bacteria that persist in the newborn. If you follow these newborns even further, up to the age of two years, you will start to see an increasing stability of the microbiota. And a microbiota which, by its composition, resembles the one that you find in adults. A number of factors affect the pattern of colonization. For example, breastfeeding influences the composition of the microbiota of the newborn. And you will hear in the second week of this course more about the mechanisms of this effect of 
breastfeeding. But it's also interesting that you will find differences among human ethnic groups. The present human race has been diversifying over the last 100,000 years. If we look in more detail at the humans that we saw on the previous phylogenetic tree, we have in fact over the last 100,000 years seen a diversification of the human race as well as a diversification by an co-evolutionary process of the microorganisms that colonize these different ethnic groups. As a result of that, you can actually demonstrate distinct differences in the bacteria that colonize individuals with a genetic, different genetic background. Here are the results of an American study looking at women of different ethnic groups but all living in the United States. You'll see an Asian population, a population of white Europeans, a population of Africans, and a population of Hispanics. And if you look at these patterns, you'll see distinct differences. It is therefore important, also in the context of what we will be discussing later on during this course, that you can never generalize from one individual to another. There may be distinct differences, and one of the differences is the bacteria that colonize the individuals. You may also understand why there is an impact of the form of delivery on the bacterial colonization pattern of the newborn. Here are res the results of a study that was published in 2011. And at the diagrams to the left, you'll see a comparison of the microbiota of different body sites in women who give birth to their children by vaginal delivery or by cesarean section delivery. And you can see the overall pattern of these microbiotas is identical. However, if you compare the microbiota of the children that were born by vaginal delivery and by cesarean section delivery, you'll see distinct differences. Whereas the newborns that are born by natural vaginal delivery have a complex microbiota which is similar to what you find in the vagina of the mother, you will in the children born by cesarean section find microorganisms that are more similar to what you find on skin surfaces of the mother. So now I will turn to a very important question. What are the advantages of the complex superorganism model in mammals? And why is it relevant to look at this? Well, in fact, if you look at how other organisms in nature become colonized with microorganisms, you'll see that there are different types of symbiosis. You can actually find lower animals who are colonized with very, very few bacteria. Often bacteria that they live in harmony with and bacteria that add to their 
physiological functions. You'll also find animals that are colonized with relatively few bacteria, a simple consortium of 2 to 25 different bacterial species. And in contrast to that, you will see what we have been talking about in humans, as well as in mice, even in zebra fishes, that we are colonized with a highly complex consortia of microorganisms. So there are various options and the evolution of our microbiota has favored the development of this highly complex consortia. And why is that? Well, there are a number of important functions of our commensal microbiota. That is the microbiota that are colonizing our surfaces and with which we live in harmony. First of all, they add to our resistance to infections. And they do that because they can inhibit colonization by pathogenic microorganisms. And they do that because they produce small peptides, usually that we call bacteria scenes, which can kill other bacteria. Some of them produce high amounts of hydrogen peroxide, which is toxic to many bacteria. Some of them produce organic acids, which lower the pH of the microenvironment where they colonize and inhibit other bacteria from establishing in that environment. And in addition to that, there are direct effects of the commensal microbiota on the host, both innate and adaptive immunity. You will hear much more about later during this course. In addition to this, our commensal microbiota, and this is particularly the case of the microbiota in the gastrointestinal tract, facilitate extraction of energy and nutrients from our food. They even provide nutrients and accessory growth factors such as vitamin K, which is produced by the gut microbiota. They also regulate host fat storage, as you'll hear more about later. And as I told you, the number of genes that become available to us is potentiated by a factor 150. So in that way, we are capable of attacking more different compounds present in our food. In addition to that, the commensal microbiota is important for the maturation of our host immune system, both the innate part of it and the adaptive part of it, and also important for the fine-tuning of its reaction pattern. For example, when do we respond with inflammation? And in that way, this is important for our potential to produce various inflammation-induced diseases. It can also be demonstrated that the commensal microbiota is important for the postnatal differentiation of our mucosal structure and function, for example, the intestinal angiogenesis. And it's interesting that you can demonstrate that there is a continuous communication between the microorganisms and our host cells, for example, affecting the expression of cell surface carbohydrates on our surfaces. For example, in our gut, we have bacteria that like to metabolize fucose. If they are present, our cells will present fucose on their surface, whereas if they are absent, fucose will not be present on the cell surface. So, a functional adaptation of the microbiota and our own cells.
you'll hear much more about the effects of the microbiota on the immune system. But right now, I'll just show you that normally we have believed that contact with microorganisms induce inflammation. Now it turns out that this is indeed correct, but only when the microorganisms challenge us, when they are pathogens that can cause disease. In contrast, many of the bacteria that belong in our commensal microbiota with which we live in our harmony are actually able to reduce inflammation. Therefore, the balance between the bacteria that induce inflammation and those that suppress inflammation is extremely important. And although you'll hear more about this later during this course, I would like already now to introduce, for example, the patients that have so-called inflammatory bowel diseases. If you look at this study, which has been mapping the bacterial species abundance in healthy individuals and patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, you can see by this statistical analysis that, for example, patients who have Crohn's disease, which is characterized by intense inflammation in the gastrointestinal mucosa, have a distinct microbiota, a microbiota that is very different from the one that you find in healthy individuals. This is an association. It does not indicate necessarily that the bacteria are responsible for the disease, but there is this association, and you'll hear much more about this later on during this course. So as a result of this differential effect of the bacteria on our immune system, and knowing that microorganisms can cause inflammatory diseases, it becomes clear that you can have a healthy microbiome where there is a balance between the bacteria that cause inflammation and those that suppress inflammation. You can also have dysbiosis. That means that the balance is destroyed but importantly, the dysbiosis can mean that you have an increased proportion of pro-inflammatory bacteria, and in that way you tilt the balance. But you can also have a dysbiosis by which there is a decreased proportion of anti-inflammatory bacteria. And if that is the case, you will also have a destroyed balance and a tendency to induce inflammation in the mucosal membranes. So both presence of pathogenic bacteria that can induce inflammation, as well as the absence of bacteria that can suppress inflammation, can mediate inflammatory diseases. And there are many examples of dysbiosis which are now related to various diseases that you will hear more, much more about in this course. And the question is, why do we see dysbiosis in the human microbiome? It is becoming clear that host genetics may induce dysbiosis. For example, Crohn's disease is associated with a mutation in the so-called NOT2 gene. And there are many other examples of genes that can be affected by mutations, 
which have a direct effect on the composition of the human microbiome and on our response to that microbiome. But in addition to that, our lifestyle is important and can induce dysbiosis in our microbiome, both in the upper respiratory tract, but also in the gastrointestinal tract. For example, our diet, smoking patterns, and stress induce changes in our microbiome and thereby what we call dysbiosis. The early colonization that I talked about is also important in this context. For example, the fact that all our babies are now born in hospitals alter the exposure, exposure to microorganisms and may have an effect on this dysbiosis. And certainly a number of medical practices such as vac vaccination, antibiotics and hygiene also affect the development of our microbiome and therefore potentially induce dysbiosis. And dysbiosis, as you will see during this course, is important for both our physiology and our health, but also important for our potential to develop a number of different diseases. And you can understand after hearing this that it can be demonstrated, for example, in a murine model, that if you give mice antibiotics early in life, that has an effect on the microbiome of the colon and induces dysbiosis and also induces in these mice adiposity. That is a tendency to overweight. And what makes this whole area exciting is almost weekly there are reports on the effect of our microbiome on a number of different important functions in our body. Our tendency to induce inflammatory bowel diseases, our tendency to develop obesity or overweight, our tendency to develop colon cancer, our tendency to develop peripheral vascular diseases, high blood pressure, ischemic heart disease, and so on. But also a number of atopic diseases like asthma are related to the compos composition of the microbiome. And even more surprising, there seems to be a link between, between the gut microbiome and the development and function of our brain. Recently, a specific bacterium was associated with autism and even some metabolic functions in that bacterium were in an animal experimental model able to induce autism. So many important aspects of our coexistence with microorganisms. And during the following weeks, you'll hear much more about this.